National Care Service. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, should a convicted rapist ever serve time in a woman's prison? First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, can I, uh, of course, point to the fact that uh, some matters that we will discuss in this uh, session of First Minister's questions are sub judice. Uh, however, uh, issues raised are operational matters for the Scottish Prison Service, and given understandable concerns that have been raised, it's important that I do address them. So I want to take some time, Presiding Officer, to set out the situation and answer. Uh, Douglas Ross's question directly, uh, very clearly. Uh, firstly, in general, any prisoner who poses a risk of sexual offending uh, is segregated from other prisoners, including during any period of risk assessment. Uh, secondly, there is no automatic right for a trans woman convicted of a crime to serve their sentence in a female prison, even if they have a gender recognition certificate. Every case is subject to rigorous individual risk assessment and as part of that, the safety of other prisoners is paramount. Uh, finally, in general terms and perhaps most importantly, I heard the Chief Executive of Rape Crisis Scotland say this yesterday, I don't see how it's possible to have a rapist within a female prison. And so let me be very clear, I agree with that statement. Bearing in mind what I've just said about the importance of individualised risk assessment as a general principle and presumption, I think that statement is correct. Uh, turning now to uh, specifics, in the case that has been in the media in recent days, uh, that risk assessment is underway. As in all cases, the Scottish Prison Service uh, won't wait until an assessment is completed if they think action is required more quickly. Now, it would not be appropriate for me, in respect of any prisoner, to give details of where they are being incarcerated. But given the understandable public and parliamentary concern in this case, I can confirm to Parliament that this prisoner will not be incarcerated at Corton Vale Women's Prison. And I hope that provides assurance to the public presiding officer, not least to the victims in this particular case. Douglas Ross. I appreciate that response from the First Minister, but this rapist is in there now. He's in segregation in a woman's prison at the moment. So I'm unsure what the First Minister is trying to say when the reality is this double rapist, this beast, is in a woman's prison right now. Uh, we think it's wrong that a rapist is sent to a woman's prison. We believe that a rapist having access to a woman's single sex space is a threat. So given what the First Minister has just said, and given he is currently in Cortonvale, does the First Minister believe that it's possible for a rapist to be held in a woman's prison as he is just now and not be a threat to women? First Minister. Um, I, I think Douglas Ross uh, should have listened perhaps more carefully to what I said. Now, I have a responsibility, presiding officer, uh, even standing in this parliament, uh, to be mindful of issues around safety and security of, of everyone. Uh, but what I said in relation to this specific case, I made some comments in general that I think should give reassurance uh, to the public. But in relation to this case, what I said, and I'm going to repeat it, the risk assessment is underway. However, as in all cases, the Scottish Prison Service uh, will not wait until an assessment is completed if they think action is required uh, more quickly. And this prisoner is not going to be incarcerated in Corton Vale uh, Women's Prison. Now, in terms of uh, the interim uh, situation um, and how uh, the situation that I've said there is going to be achieved. I've got to be mindful uh, of allowing the Scottish Prison Service uh, to do their operational job and to do that properly. But I'll go back to one of the things uh, that I said in general, and this applies to any prisoner, uh, regardless of whether they're trans or not, regardless of whether they are in a male or a female uh, prison. If any prisoner uh, poses and is considered to pose uh, a risk or gives rise uh, to any concern about sexual offending, uh, that prisoner is segregated from other prisoners, and that applies during any period of risk assessment. Um, so I think I'm being uh, very clear to Parliament in light of public concerns, but I am also allowing 
uh, having regard uh, to important issues of security and safety to allow the Scottish Prison Service to undertake their operational responsibilities in relation to an individual case. Douglas Ross. First Minister, you just have to be clear with people. Uh, can you confirm that a double rapist is currently being held in a woman's prison? Because that's the situation. Uh, and let's just hear what the former governor of Corton Vale Prison, Rona Hotchkiss, has said about this. I am absolutely clear about the fact that they should be in a male prison. You simply cannot have someone like this terrorising women. She continued, it's a red line I would not have crossed. But this double rapist only decided to change gender after he was charged by the police. It took the threat of jail for this criminal to decide to change his gender. That's not a coincidence, that is a conscious decision. Now, the First Minister is hiding behind the Scottish Prison Service, but they are a government agency accountable to SNP ministers. So all this really comes down to is what ministers decide. They had the power to prevent this happening, and they still have the power to change this in the first 72 hours under Rule 19.1a of the Scottish Prison Service rules. So can I ask the First Minister, above asking where he currently is, was there any, any ministerial involvement in the decision to send this rapist to a woman's prison? And before that 72 hours expire tomorrow, will the First Minister personally intervene and remove this double rapist from Corton Vale? First Minister. I, I think I'd repeat some of what I've already said, but let me, be, let me be clear. This prisoner is not going to be incarcerated in Corton Vale, either short term or long term. There is an Members, importance the of minister. allowing the Scottish Prison Service operationally to give effect to what I have just said. And that is important uh, to stress. Uh, these are operational matters for the Scottish Prison Service. The very fact I am standing here and addressing them, and I think most people listening to what I am saying right now will understand fully uh, what I am saying. Uh, I am not, to use Douglas Ross's phrase, hiding behind anyone. I am setting out very clearly, uh, firstly, that I agree with the comments of the Chief Executive of Rape Crisis uh, Scotland uh, yesterday when she said, and I repeat, I don't see how it's possible to have a rapist within a female prison. It is, of course, right and proper, right and proper, uh, that there are individualised risk assessments done on every prisoner, uh, and that is important, but I agree with that statement. And what I have said is that short-term or long-term, uh, this prisoner is not going to be in Corrington Vale, but it is important to allow the Scottish Prison Service operationally to give effect to the decisions that they have taken. Douglas Ross. I, I'm sorry, I've asked this three times now, so I'm going to ask for a fourth and final opportunity that I have. Where is this double rapist at the moment? Is he currently in a woman's prison here in Scotland, First Minister? Yes or no? And I'm sorry, all of this stuff about the Scottish Prison Service, this is the rules that the Scottish Prison Service have to work to. Rule 15.1 about the allocation of prisoners does allow ministers to intervene. Ministers could have intervened before now. And Rule 19.1a gives 72 hours for this to be challenged. That expires tomorrow, and we heard nothing from the First Minister about what she is going to do about that. Now, we have warned for months that violent criminals just like the sex offender, the absolute beast we are discussing today, would try to exploit loopholes in the law and attack and traumatise women. The problem, as we have said all along, is not trans people. The problem is violent offenders. But now, before the SNP's GRR bill has even come into force, rapists are currently exploiting the current laws. We shouldn't make it any easier for them to attack women. Now, Nicola Sturgeon has uh, seemed to reject that the fact that he's currently there isn't a risk to women. I, I can't agree with that. So can I ask the First Minister, will she go to Corton Vale? Will she personally explain to the women there who are sharing their prison with a double rapist why on earth her government is allowing them to be in a cell next door? First Minister. 
Again, I think if Douglas Ross uh, was actually listening and uh, was paying attention to the facts of what I'm setting out, he would know what I am saying. What I'm saying is, firstly, the Scottish Prison Service is in the process of giving effect uh, to the decision it has taken not to incarcerate uh, this prisoner in Cornton Vale. And before uh, the 72-hour period expires that Douglas Ross has referred to, uh, my expectation is that this prisoner will not be in Cornton Vale Prison. Uh, so that, I think, to most people and to people uh, who are reasonable, uh, would be a very clear explanation of the situation. Uh, there are, of course, very, very uh, small uh, number uh, of trans women who are currently in prison custody, and in fact, many of them are in male prisons. There is no automatic right uh, for any trans woman to serve their sentence in a female prison that is subject to robust risk assessment. Uh, that is right and proper. Um, and lastly, presiding officer, to be fair to Douglas Ross, he made this point, and it is an important point. Uh, we must always be careful when we're having uh, these exchanges that we do not, even inadvertently, uh, suggest that somehow trans women uh, pose an inherent threat uh, to women. Predatory men, as has always been the case, are the risk to women. However, as with any group in society, a small number of trans people will offend. Um, and where that relates to sexual offending, public concern is understandable. That's why the systems that the prison service uh, have in place already are robust. Uh, and as I think I am setting out here, uh, in this individual case, uh, those systems lead to the right outcomes. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. President Officer, tomorrow marks Holocaust Memorial Day, where we remember the six million Jews who lost their lives and other victims of Nazi persecution, and the victims of genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur. Every day in politics we see division, but today we stand shoulder to shoulder in the face of anti-Semitism and all other forms of prejudice and hate. We unite to say never again, but we can't be complacent. We still have a long way to go to create a more equal and more peaceful world. Last week, one in three people waited more than, four, more than the four-hour standard in A&E. There is a continuing crisis in Scotland's accident and emergency departments, a crisis caused by decisions made by this government over the past 15 years. Patients are waiting longer for care than ever before, and we know long waits cost lives. So can the First Minister tell the Chamber how many people waited over 24 hours in A&E in the last year? First Minister. Uh, firstly, can I associate myself with Anna Sarwar's comments about Holocaust Memorial Day? This week, of course, we do remember all of the victims of genocide. That is important, but it is also important on this occasion to rededicate ourselves uh, to the fight against prejudice, hatred and intolerance. And I know we are all united in that endeavour. In terms of the specific uh, figure that Anna Sarwar uh, has asked for, I suspect he is about to give it to me, but if he doesn't, I will provide it to him uh, later. Uh, the situation in our accident and emergency departments uh, remains very acute. There is significant pressure on the NHS generally and on emergency care in particular. However, uh, we are uh, at this stage seeing an improving uh, situation. Uh, since the start of January, for example, waits over both eight and 12 hours uh, have fallen by around 40% uh, in each. Uh, so there is work still to do. Uh, we are supporting the NHS in that work, uh, but we are hopeful that we are seeing the severity of uh, the winter crisis uh, start to abate and that we will see further improvements over the week to come. Anna Sarwar. Uh, is right. Um, uh, sorry, the First Minister is right. I do know the number and she should know the number too because it impacts on people across this country every single day. Uh, the answer the First Minister was looking for is 6,362 people waited more than 24 hours in a &E last year. In 2019, that number was 48. Let me repeat that. 48 people waited more than 24 hours in 2019. In 2022, that number increased to 6,362, and some waited even longer. 1,356 people waited more than 36 hours in a and &E, and 390 people waited more than 48 hours. That's two whole days waiting in a and &E. This is the worst it has ever been. Staff are burnt out, 
patients' lives are at risk, and a &E doctors are telling us that 36 people could die due to long waits this week alone. So what is the First Minister doing right now to prevent these unnecessary deaths this week, next week and in future weeks too? First Minister, well, I have set out in recent weeks the actions uh, we are taking the investment in the winter plan, investment in additional interim care beds, for example, and other support for the National Health Service. Uh, long waits, whether in accident emergency units or in any other part of the NHS, are unacceptable. Um, and they do have consequences, which is why we work so hard to reduce uh, and eliminate uh, long waits in the NHS. Of course, there is always uh, something missing from Anna Sarwar's questions, important though these questions are, uh, when he compares figures from 2018 to now. And that, of course, is a global pandemic yeah. uh, that we have been dealing with in the intervening period. Uh, that said, uh, it remains the priority uh, to tackle waits in our National Health Service, which is why uh, we are cautiously optimistic, uh, although not complacent, about the improvements we are seeing in accident and emergency units. So the latest weekly figures, for example, uh, show four-hour performance up 6.7 uh, points on the previous week. And as I've said, we are starting now to see significant declines in the uh, percentages of people and indeed in the numbers of people uh, waiting over both uh, eight hours and 12 hours. But there is still a lot of work to do to support staff. And of course, one of the things uh, we have done here in Scotland, which has not been replicated uh, in England or uh, in Wales, of course, where there is a Labour government, is offer uh, staff the best possible pay increase that we can yeah. uh, on average 7.5% here in Scotland compared to 4.5% where Labour are in government in Wales. Anna Sarwar. Pray, officer, listening to that response from the First Minister, I can understand the anger of staff and patients. This is what one nurse told the Daily Record this week. Patients are not angry at the NHS but with the Scottish Government. The First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary need to speak to these patients. The Scottish Government do not see these patients as human beings, as someone's mum or someone's dad. This is about human life. Each and every single one of these SNP, MSPs, constituents whose lives are at risk every single day. And it's not good enough for the First Minister to keep making excuses or to talk about COVID because demand on A&E is actually down by nearly 120,000 people compared to 2019. Fewer people are using A&E, but waiting times are still longer than they've ever been. Scotland's NHS is at breaking point and things are only getting worse on Nicola Sturgeon's watch. The longest ever waits at A&E. Patients waiting hours in ambulances to even get into A&E. 776,000 people, one in seven Scots, on an NHS waiting list and record-breaking delayed discharge. Our NHS, our patients and our staff deserve so much better than this. So why should people across Scotland continue to accept the unacceptable from this SNP government? First Minister. Firstly, Presiding Officer, every single patient uh, seen on our National Health Service is a human being. And frankly, I think it demeans Anna Sarwar's argument to suggest that any of us don't think uh, that is the case. Well, Anna Sarwar, Anna Sarwar is responsible for what he says in this chamber. Nobody else is responsible for what Anna Sarwar says in this chamber. Um, second point I would make, Anna Sarwar asked me in his previous question uh, what action uh, the government was taking. He then pointed to reduce demand for accident emergency services. Uh, that is actually because of the action that is being taken. Uh, the ambulance service see and treat so that so many more patients uh, now get seen and treated without ever having to go to a hospital. NHS 24, the work they are doing to reduce attendances at hospital or admissions to hospital. So that actually is an example uh, of the actions we are taking having an impact. Um, and then lastly, presiding officer, I, I take responsibility as the health secretary uh, for NHS Scotland every single day of the week. But Anna Sarwar's argument seems to be that this is all somehow uniquely down to the SNP. Um, and I know he doesn't like comparisons, but if he's going to make that argument, uh, then I'm afraid they are inevitable. If it's all down to the SNP, then why is it that in the uh, latest uh, full months that we have statistics for, A&E performance in Scotland is 6.2 percentage points better than it is in Wales, where Labour is in government? Ah. The fact of the matter is, 
pressure on the health service is intense in Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, we are dealing with that pressure and in many respects those who work so hard across our Briefly, NHS First in Minister. Scotland are doing a better job uh, than we find in many other parts of the UK. Yeah. Question number three, Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Apologies. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that dozens of people living in Scotland with no recourse to public funds are being made homeless and forced to sleep rough on the streets or in cars. First Minister. Uh, stopping people who are uh, facing destitution from accessing support when they need it most uh, is unacceptable and I think shocking. It is disturbing in the extreme that the UK government's no recourse to public funds policy prevents local and national government from providing support to people and it remains the biggest barrier to eradicating rough sleeping in Scotland. Immigration and the no recourse to public funds policy are entirely reserved matters. We have repeatedly raised the devastating impact of these policies. We will, however, continue to work with COSLA uh, to improve access to support and services for people who are subject to these policies as far as we possibly can within devolved powers. Maggie Chapman. Thank you for that answer. No one should be made homeless, forced into destitution or have their human rights infringed regardless of their immigration status. The UK's immigration system and NRPF policy in particular prevents people accessing essential safety and lifeline services in times of need. Lack of provision and support risks leaving some people open to modern slavery and exploitation. In Scotland, the Ending Destitution Together strategy seeks to ensure that those with no recourse are protected as far as possible within devolved powers. Can the First Minister say what is being done to ensure that as much support as possible is available and that people make use of that support? And can she tell us how information, including about nationalities, is being collected on how many people with no recourse are homeless or at risk of being homeless? First Minister. Well, thank Maggie Chapman for raising these issues. Information on the number of people at risk of homelessness uh, will be collated via ongoing engagement with the third sector and local authorities. Uh, as I said in my previous answer, we will continue to do all we can within devolved powers, including funding, support and advice services. For example, we have provided over £900,000 since 2020 to ensure the operation of winter support in Edinburgh and Glasgow, which is open to everyone. Uh, COSLA has also produced guidance to ensure people subject to the no recourse to public funds policy are supported to access services available to them and updated guidance will be published later this year. It is, however, critical that the UK Government changes this no recourse to public funds policy so that we can act to support everyone in Scotland at times of crisis, regardless of their immigration status. Question number four, John Mason. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the second round of the UK Government's levelling up fund allocations in Scotland. First Minister. We fundamentally disagree with Westminster Government making decisions in devolved areas. Uh, of course, any additional funding is welcome, but this should be devolved uh, through the Barnett formula, uh, just as we were promised the EU funding would be devolved after Brexit to allow Scottish ministers and councils to make decisions about its use. Uh, the fund overlooks Scotland's distinct economic needs and the latest awards show that many remote, rural and sparsely populated regions are being ignored. Uh, I'm further disappointed that UK ministers decided after bids had been submitted to consider which local authorities had received funding in the first round, meaning councils in Scotland wasted money, time and effort bidding for funds they were no longer eligible for. Uh, the evidence, I think, is clear. This uh, so-called levelling up approach means Scotland is losing out. John Mason. I yeah, thank the First Minister for that answer. And it seems that uh, less well-off areas like Glasgow have lost out in round two and were possibly misled as to the bidding process by the UK Government. Does she share my opinion that a levelling up fund should be tar targeting the poorer areas? Surely it has to be either levelling up or geographical spread. It cannot be both. First Minister. Uh, yes, John Mason is absolutely right and I share his concern that Glasgow and other council areas in Scotland with high levels of deprivation have lost out. Uh, of course, if the Scottish Government uh, had been given control of this funding, uh, which have, would have been the correct and sensible course of action, uh, then we could have, would not have taken the competitive dash for cash approach favoured by the UK Government. The UK can, of course, still choose to devolve funding to Scotland for our share of the remaining levelling up funding and we would be happy to discuss this with them. And of course, this is not just 
just our view, the Tory Mayor of uh, the West Midlands uh, described this as another example of Whitehall's bidding and begging bowl culture, and he said he cannot understand why the levelling up funding money was not devolved for local decision makers to decide on what is best for their areas. I completely agree with that. Question number five, Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps are being taken to tackle unethical and illegal dog breeding in light of recent reports of high-value extreme breeding programmes operating in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, the recent BBC programmes on illegal and unethical dog breeding paint an alarming picture. The Scottish Government is actively working with a number of government and key stakeholder organisations, including the SPCA and Police Scotland, to disrupt the activities of those involved in the unlicensed puppy trade. New animal licensing regulations were introduced in 2021, covering the breeding and selling of dogs to tackle the growing issues linked to puppy farming. We intend to consult on the potential licensing of other activities including canine fertility clinics later this year. Furthermore, several puppy campaigns have been run over the past few years to highlight the cruelty of the trade, uh, to raise public awareness and provide advice on how to buy a puppy safely. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that? Anyone who saw the BBC Disclosure Programme, which I commend to the Chamber, will be anything but horrified, disgusted and as angry about this uh, as I am. This is a multi-million pound pet industry which has been fuelled by consumer demand for designer dogs, it has been run by organised crime and it is a pet industry based on nothing but greed. These dogs are now more valuable to criminals than drugs, I am afraid to say. And these are dogs which often result in tragic consequences and the loss of life. And it is happening right here, right now in Scotland. Can I first of all ask why there are so few prosecutions uh, for illegal dog breeding here in Scotland relevant to the number of incidents reported? Secondly, what specific legislation is the Scottish Government willing to bring forward to crack down on illegal and unethical breeding and selling? And that inc includes closing any loopholes on co-ownership of dogs. And will this whole Parliament now send the strongest possible message to those involved in this disgusting trade that we will not put up with your cruelty anymore? And if you break the law, you will pay a heavy price for it. First Minister. I I absolutely agree with Jamie Green. He's right to bring these issues to the, the, the Chamber. Uh, this behaviour is despicable, it is illegal and unethical, and people who engage in it uh, should expect to face the full force of the law. Uh, Jamie Green asked me about numbers of prosecutions as he uh, understands uh, prosecution is not a matter uh, for ministers' decisions about prosecution. Uh, they are matters for the police and the prosecution authorities. I will uh, ask law officers, uh, though, to write to him if there is further information uh, that they can helpfully uh, provide. I indicated in my previous answer that having introduced uh, regulations in 2021, we do intend to consult on the licensing, potential licensing of other activities uh, later this year, and that will give everyone across uh, Parliament the opportunity to contribute to that consultation. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome that exchange. And further to that, I welcome the Government's support for my Welfare of Dogs Bill shortly to be introduced, which will require, if passed, prospective dog owners to rigorously consider fully the welfare of a puppy in all aspects, including the breeding, before buying. Does the First Minister therefore agree with me that if this leads to educated demand, the supply of puppies, cruelly bred, will reduce and cut off these vast profits already referred to, which go to criminals who care nothing for the welfare of the puppies, seeing them only as fashionable, marketable commodities? First Minister. Yes, I, I do very much ag agree with that, and I think that is a point very well made. Uh, we've got to consider uh, the issues of supply and demand and, of course, the interrelationship between them. Um, I very much welcome uh, any and all proposals that support animal welfare, and I take the opportunity to applaud Christine Graham for all her hard work over a long period of time to bring forward uh, the legislation she refers to. I look forward to the Bill's imminent introduction, uh, which I understand will raise much-needed awareness on the responsibility of owning a dog, and I'm sure the bill will have strong support from all parties right across the chamber. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to increase uptake of the HPV vaccine in light of warnings from Joe's Trust that girls in the most deprived areas of Scotland are missing out. First Minister. 
Uh, well, firstly, Scotland has the highest uptake rates of the HPV vaccine across the four nations, but we do want to go further and increase uptake, uh, particularly in the most deprived areas. Uh, therefore, from the 1st of January, a simplified one-dose schedule was introduced for all those eligible up to their 25th birthday, and we anticipate this will further increase uptake. One-dose HPV vaccine uptake is currently 91.5% for girls in S4 and 88.4% for girls in the most deprived areas. Uh, we have provided over £400,000 to Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust uh, to support their campaign work on screening benefits. Uh, and my officials will also be happy to work with them, along with Public Health Scotland and health boards, to understand how we can maximise uptake rates in areas of deprivation. The creation of a women's health champion provides a further opportunity uh, for issues of this kind to be promoted and addressed. And indeed, I am delighted to announce today the appointment of Professor Anna Glazier as Scotland's first women's health champion. Professor Glazier uh, will be key to driving improvement in women's health and helping address the inequalities that have persisted in women's health for far too long. Jackie Bailey. Can I welcome the announcement for the from the First Minister? It is, however, 18 months months later than originally intended. Um, the World Health Organization target for fully vaccinating girls against HPV is 90%, but the latest figures for Scotland last year show that only 77% of girls in the most deprived areas were fully vaccinated. The World Health Organization also recommends that 70% of women are screened, but again, women from the most deprived areas are less likely to take part in screening programs with uptake only reaching 63%. We have the tools in Scotland to end cervical cancer, but the Scottish Government are not using them. Vaccination rates are too low, self-sampling too slow to roll out, colposcopy weights of a year for women with abnormal smear tests and continuing inequalities for women in the poorest communities. Will the First Minister commit to addressing this as a matter of urgency and set out a clear plan in the next month so that cervical cancer can be eliminated in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, of course, we do have a, a women's health plan that addresses these and many other issues. I think we were the first part of the UK to have a women's health plan. And of course, Professor Glazier uh, will now have the key task of driving that forward. These are really important issues, uh, but I don't think it's the case uh, that the Scottish Government is not using all levers. In relation to HPV vaccine uptake, as I said, uh, earlier, Scotland actually has the highest uptake rates uh, across all of the four UK uh, nations um, and we have recognised uh, that we need to do more and are doing more uh, through, for example, the simplified one-dose schedule. Uh, and we are seeing the benefits of that. Since vaccination of girls started in 2008, the number of cases uh, with precancerous cells identified in that population at cervical screening has reduced by almost 90% in comparison with rates in women who were not vaccinated. So we will continue to take these important steps to improve the health of girls and women uh, in this respect and indeed in all other respects as well. Thank you. We move to general and constituency supplementaries and I call Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. Can I draw the attention of the First Minister to the experience of a constituent of mine who informed me they were told to make an in-store purchase ahead of using a paypoint facility to top up their energy meter? Paypoint have confirmed to me this should never happen, and Paypoint have contacted the business in question. Does the First Minister agree with me that whilst the vast majority of Paypoint vendors are professional and provide an important service, that where unacceptable practice exists, such as what I have highlighted at moments ago, there should be, this should be reported swiftly and acted upon, and that this experience yet again highlights the barriers and vulnerabilities faced by many on prepayment meters? First Minister. Um, yes, I, I do very much agree with that. I would echo Bob Doris's concerns uh, and what he has said in response to those. Uh, I am obviously also aware of issues of this type and would urge people to raise their concerns with an advice agency and with their energy provider to get the necessary advice and support. Uh, but I do think it is incumbent on the UK Government, because this is a reserve matter, to take more action on prepayment uh, meters, uh, forcing people onto them, particularly for very small amounts 
expense of debt during uh, winter makes matters worse for people, uh, not better, and is more likely to increase uh, debt and leave people unable to heat their homes. Um, so I would urge the UK Government uh, to respond to that uh, and to listen to the calls from many uh, and ban energy companies from being able to force people onto prepayment meters. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, Falkirk Council is considering closing four school swimming pools and one public pool to make ends meet. Now, I've had numerous emails about this, and it boils down to council funding cuts from this government. So does the First Minister agree with me that closing swimming pools is a retrograde step, and what does she intend to do about it? First Minister. Well, firstly... Uh, council budgets are not being cut. The draft budget for this year proposes a £570 million increase in the local government settlement. Of course, had the Tories had their way uh, and we'd seen tax cuts for the very richest in our society, council budgets would have had to be uh, cut. So thankfully, we didn't follow Conservative advice in that regard. Um, but finally, we are still in the budget process. So here is an offer to the member, indeed to all on the, the Tory benches. Uh, we work within an effectively fixed budget where we can increase revenue. We're doing that by asking those uh, who earn the most to pay a little bit more to help public services. Uh, but if the, the Tories, uh, contrary to their actions, of course, south of the border, but if here the Tories want to see more money for councils or for anybody else, then tell us where within the draft budget we should take that money and we're happy to have a conversation. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister may recall the question I put to her before Christmas regarding councils placing unaccompanied children seeking asylum in hotels. Since then, there have been reports that there have been at least 200 children missing and abducted from six home office hotels in England. I know the First Minister will share my horror and the horror of this chamber, I'm sure, at the safety of these children and unaccompanied children in Scotland, making that assurance that that has been de delivered here, regardless of which authority is providing their accommodation. So is she aware of any similar instances of those reported in England occurring in Scotland? And what can she provide an update uh, on what steps the government is providing to ensure that unaccompanied children are being moved from hotels into secure accommodation? First Minister. Well, I do obviously recall the question that was asked before Christmas. I uh, will write to the member with any update I can give him in terms of actions being taken uh, by local councils here in Scotland, uh, supported uh, where necessary and appropriate by the Scottish Government uh, to address these uh, very real concerns and uh, include any information councils have about unaccompanied uh, children here in Scotland. Um, in relation to the general issue, I think everybody uh, must have been deeply shocked uh, to hear this week uh, the revelation uh, that 200 uh, children have gone uh, missing when they should have been uh, effectively in the care of the Home Office. And uh, what perhaps is even more shocking than that is you know, how little attention there seems to uh, be a, a paid to this. Uh, if a child rightly if a child uh, here in this country goes missing, uh, there is rightly lots of attention. Uh, that should be no different in the case of these unaccompanied uh, children uh, here. Uh, children, while they are here, uh, they are our responsibility and we should care for them, we should love them uh, and we should make sure that they are uh, looked after. So I will uh, respond to Paul Sweeney's question in relation to local authorities here, but I hope all of us across uh, the chamber can unite today to demand uh, for everybody, but particularly for children, uh, much more humanity in the UK government approach to immigration and asylum. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Men's sheds in communities across Scotland uh, provide a place for men to meet, to socialise uh, and to pursue hobbies. But increasingly, it's recognised they make a tangible difference in terms of tackling isolation, loneliness and mental ill health. It's why uh, Men's Shed commands strong cross-party support right across the chamber and why over 40 MSPs recently wrote to the Deputy First Minister expressing concerns about proposed funding cuts. So will the First Minister guarantee that our government will protect the core and development funding for the Scottish Men's Sheds Association to allow this invaluable public health movement to be maintained and expanded. First Minister. 
the Men's Shed uh, movement does fantastic work, and I would associate myself uh, with the comments that Liam MacArthur has made um, about the work that it does and the impact that it has. My understanding is that there has been uh, discussions uh, with the government. An offer of financial support has been made uh, for the next financial year, and I will ask the Minister concerned to write uh, to the member with more detail and indeed to make that known to Parliament generally. Go Cap Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am I'm very concerned on the reports of potential reduction in teacher numbers, especially with regards to Glasgow. Can the First Minister reveal what action the Scottish Government can take to protect teacher numbers? First Minister. Uh, the Government will act to protect teacher numbers. This Government has a commitment to increase teacher numbers and indeed councils are being given additional funding specifically to deliver that. Uh, so it would not be acceptable to me or to the Scottish Government to see teacher numbers fall. I can confirm therefore uh, that the Government does intend to take steps to ensure that the funding we are providing to councils to maintain increased numbers of teachers actually delivers that outcome and the Education Secretary will set out more details to Parliament in the coming days. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In a spate of crashes on the A96, two weeks ago two people were seriously injured, last week three people were hospitalised and just yesterday two more were hospitalised. Now, a P&J poll showed 93% of respondents demanding this road be duelled. Yeah. And Gillian Martin, MSP, wrote persuasively at the weekend, we must duel the A96 for safety, equity and environmental reasons. Yeah. However, it is reported that no final decision on duelling has been or will be made perhaps for years. So, First Minister, how many more accidents and injuries will it take before her government listens to the yeah. people of the North East, yeah. stops the delaying tactics and delivers on its decade-old promise yeah. to duel this appalling road. First Minister. Well, firstly, Presiding Officer, firstly, uh, my thoughts go to uh, everyone who sustains uh, injuries on our roads and indeed to anyone who is uh, bereaved through accidents on our roads. Uh, the government's commitments in terms of duelling and upgrading the A96 uh, stand, uh, of course there are assessments and reviews, uh, not least environmental assessments and reviews uh, underway as is right and proper and the Transport Secretary uh, will keep Parliament updated as appropriate. Pauline McNeill. Thank you. The west of Scotland is the industrial heartland of Scotland with a heavy concentration in Glasgow city region that has 57% of the worst 15% of areas of multiple deprivation. But yet an excellent bid, the Clyde Green Freeport, was not supported by the government even though the bid fully met the criteria in tackling deprivation and boosting manufacturing. I think it's important to note that eight local authorities supported this bid as a central requirement for submission. Not an easy thing to pull together. But yet the successful bids were on the east and none on the west. So I wonder if the First Minister is satisfied and how she would justify these decisions. And would she outline what the plan is then to compensate Glasgow and the wider city region and Clyde communities which were also involved in this bid? But I think it's also important, because I realise, I, I don't know why the bid was rejected, but for full transparency, I think we need to see the reasons why the West of Scotland did not uh, be, have any designation of a freeport designation for whatever, you know, I don't know the full implications of being a freeport, but it did concern me as a member of the Glasgow City region that there's no freeport in the West of Scotland. First Minister. Well, a number of very high quality bids uh, were submitted, including the one that Polly McNeill refers to. Uh, these were uh, assessed in line with the published criteria, and this was uh, a joint decision making process between the Scottish and the UK governments, and the successful uh, bidders were announced two weeks ago. Uh, I understand the disappointment on the part of the, the bids that were not successful. Uh, it doesn't mean the bids were not uh, high quality, uh, but successful bids had to be selected. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to continued work uh, with unsuccessful uh, bidders uh, and the regions that they were bidding for uh, to look to see what we can do to support them uh, deliver on their ambitions and objectives for the future. Fergus Ewing. Presiding officer, tomorrow, the 27th January, is Holocaust Memorial Day, which marks the anniversary 
of the liberation 78 years ago uh, of Auschwitz Treblinka, uh, the largest uh, Nazi death camp. Does the First Minister uh, support the great work which is done by the Holocaust Educational Trust uh, and our schools and others in teaching successive generations of our children about the atrocities which saw over six million people murdered, slaughtered, uh, uh, including, of course, six million Jews and many other minorities. Uh, does the First Minister agree that it's this work, this educational work, is essential so that we never, ever forget the lessons that atrocities and oppression must be fought wheresoever they occur? First Minister. I associate myself wholeheartedly uh, with Fergus Ewing's comments on Holocaust Memorial Day and indeed throughout the year I am very proud that the Scottish Government strongly supports the excellent work of the Holocaust Educational Trust to enable young people across Scotland to continue to learn from the atrocities of the Holocaust as we challenge the oppressions of the present. Uh, I know some members will have the privilege this week of hearing directly from the Trust's young ambassadors about the impact of Holocaust education on their lives. That's a privilege I've had in previous years. Uh, indeed, I had the opportunity a few years ago uh, with the Trust to visit Auschwitz, and that was one of the most profoundly uh, moving experiences of my life. I think we all agree that education has a key role to play in building a society that actively challenges discrimination, hate, intolerance and prejudice in all of its forms and advances equality. We should do that all year round, uh, but Holocaust Memorial Day every year gives us the opportunity to rededicate ourselves to that very important responsibility. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Fergus Ewing. There will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so before the debate begins.